Thank you. I think we are now live. Thank you very much for joining and welcome to this special episode of ESI, uh, Entrepreneurship Startups Innovation. This is our webinar series to discuss how innovation is shaping the post-pandemic recovery in ASEAN, in Asia, and sometimes also beyond. Uh, we are here to discuss uh, uh, a little bit of a more geeky technical issue. So we want to talk about uh, how we can better measure innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem, especially uh, in ASEAN. And we are going to do that uh, uh, on the basis of a policy brief that we recently published. Please keep an eye on the chat box. We are going to share a couple of links that could be of interest to you, including the publications we will present uh, through the chat box. Um, and this is a collaboration between us, Ediria, and uh, uh, researchers at the University of Edinburgh, uh, Alessandro Rosiello and uh, Matthias Widmar. I'm going to introduce them in a minute. And we are very lucky because also with us, uh, um, especially during the panel discussion, we have uh, uh, a representative from the APEC Secretariat, Emmanuel, that I will also introduce very shortly. Uh, before we go straight uh, into uh, the conversation, uh, let me uh, please just remind you that uh, um, we want to hear from you, um, especially uh, use the chat box function to share your ideas, your comments, and also your questions for the speakers, because we will get back to your questions uh, during the final segment of this webinar uh, during the Q&A segment. And please uh, keep your microphone on mute uh, uh, during the entire duration of the webinar. So uh, it's, I think, now time to start. Let's go directly straight uh, into the conversation. And let me uh, give you the floor, uh, give the floor to uh, Alessandro Rosiello, Senior Lecturer, Business School, Entrepreneurship and Innovation and Innogen Institute, University of Edinburgh, and Matthias Widmar, Lecturer in Engineering and Management, School of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Alessandro and Matt, the floor is yours. Over to you. Well, thank you so much, Julia. And um, in fact, let's just also say that it was an absolute uh, pleasure and privilege uh, first that you've approached us to uh, to work on this together and, of course, uh, working with you. Um, and though the couple of slides that we're presenting uh, just now are, are a bit more on our sort of research work and um, and the way that the, the methodology was developed, um, the whole package was just uh, super exciting. And as I'll mention at the end, we are absolutely thrilled for thinking of the next phase of this research, which would hopefully bring um, more data, more uh, in-depth understanding of emerging places of innovation-driven entrepreneurship uh, across ASEAN, and as you said, um, around Asia and around the world. Uh, so I'll share my screen. I hope you can all uh, actually see that now. Um, it should be just uh, a, a, a first slide for my talk. Um, so the starting premise uh, behind this, um, this project or this um, the, the policy brief, but the, the research that went into it, was that there is a shifting understanding as to how we try and measure entrepreneurship, uh, both from a research point of view, but even more so, uh, there is a greater need uh, from the policymaking community, as well as, um, generally speaking, from entrepreneurs themselves. So uh, the starting point is, is this. So we've uh, currently, um, the way that in entrepreneurial ecosystems um, are mapped um, in kind of a local placemaking setting uh, is through various utilization of sort of innovation hotspots or you know places where there is actually a significant critical mass of entrepreneurial innovation activity, um, and these activity are usually geographically grouped together. Um, there's many theories of sort of clustering and how clustering um, actually um, supports um, entrepreneurship and the commercialization of innovative ideas, and there's a sort of a strength of local ecosystem. Um, especially in terms of the support that the enabling infrastructure, both physical infrastructures in you know office spaces and and you know tech hubs, laboratory spaces, um, access to internet, etc., as well as the social support, the sort of you know the training on business practices, on legal and IP protection regimes, and all sorts of things like that. They all make constituent parts of these sort of um, hotspots. But the other critical question really is, is that, well, that's all nice and good, but that's just, um, you know, that's just the, the infrastructure in order for this to be catalyzed, 
there is a there is a match you need to uh, you need to um, to lit up, um, and that is the uh, level of investment in innovation uh, that is actually present. And so people have tried to map this out. There's a there's a nice sort of um, world um, sort of international patent organization uh, report about like how do you actually by agglomerating activities by having you know the right kind of uh, ingredients um, you can start a, a kind of an ecosystem. People have been trying to map out the distribution of these um, sort of conceptual, more conceptual parameters. And the, you know, the identification things were things like you know, uh, patents and utility patents, trademarking, scientific publications. So basically, the knowledge production side of things. Um, then networking connections, centrality. You know, are people actually well integrated together? That's the kind of idea of this sort of clustering infrastructure. Um, then physical infrastructure. What's the market like? Even what culture, right? What kind of you know ideas do people have? What kind of values do people attach to um, to sort of entrepreneurial um, activities was very very important. And then of course that's underpinned by capabilities, both again sort of skills and 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 um, um, knowledge, sort of the, the formal the formal training, um, as well as sort of just how deployed those capabilities are through R and intensity. So you can see there's a kind of an awful lot of different kind of parameters. Um, and it's it's really challenging to actually uh, unpick this and and create a re representable metrics uh, to measure this. Now there are actually quite a few different um, ways to measure this. Um, the one that's perhaps been used the most in academic literature is patent mapping. Um, the work, especially by uh, Professor Crescenzi and many of his colleagues, um, and then they've been tracing sort of patents and how patenting. The volume of patenting and also the quality of patenting has sort of shifted over the past decades. And using that sort of patenting landscape, which you know, in theory, you think about it, kind of has most of the elements of this sort of entrepreneurial activity: a new knowledge, b it's applied, so it's kind of sent into the real world to actually be tested as part of a kind of technological. That's why you get a patent; you don't just get it because to know something, but to other actually protect your IP, to build value in that, and then to obviously also deploy it. So we see these trends. We see these trends, for instance, that the, the patenting has kind of shifted a lot of the patenting uh, because it kind of comes from the Western sort of legal regime has, you know, of course, first been done in the West. And then now it's shifted more uh, globally around the world. And of course, there are also huge patches in between where actually there is not that much patenting activity, which already points to the point that actually a lot of the patenting activity is not evenly distributed, as well as the patents kind of serve different sort of purposes in different sort of places. Um, and Crescenzi and others have actually done a lot of analysis as to actually where are, where are patents deployed to be really of value and of use as a technological uh, way to drive new, new products and services, and where they're basically done for other reasons, like you know, increasing research metrics in universities or indeed uh, you know, attracting uh, particular inward investment or indeed, you know, there's many different cultural reasons why actually patents are being deployed. Um, and as I say, so there's, there's gaps in this. There's first of all the uneven distribution. There's also different accessibility of patenting infrastructure. So the ability to actually file patents in different countries uh, varies a lot. Um, so they're not a an absolute measure of of um, sort of in innovation driven entrepreneurship landscape. Now, on the flip side of that, I mentioned so this is the kind of the, the from the from the almost the knowledge production, the innovation side of things. On the more entrepreneurial side of things, there's been recently quite a lot of sort of um, emerging ecosystem mapping. This is uh, taken from the startup genome uh, report. Um, you know, there's many ways in which uh, both consultancy companies as well as investors try to map and look at, you know, what's hot, where there's actually a lot of activity um, in sort of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. They're usually measured by the kind of a combination of um, investment opportunities, the bit of a buzz, which is kind of slightly kind of elusive sort of quality, um, and then just the critical mass of entrepreneurs and startup companies. And you can see that and we've highlighted in yellow the ones in, in Asia, not just the, in the ASEAN countries, but across, across Asia. And one thing that you can kind of see is that actually they are all pretty much like either large, you know, capital cities or a, a number of um, sort of really, really strong industrial hubs. So these are necessarily emerging uh, ecosystem, even though um, startup genome here classified them across these sort of three different um, emergent phases. 
Um, these are actually you know, places that people already know. And I think the challenge that we're really getting to, and I think the challenge that policymakers have is that, okay, on one hand, you know, patenting is useful maybe to understand where a lot of the kind of knowledge generating activity is being produced, but it is patchy. It doesn't actually cover absolutely everything. And it's in particular not necessarily very good in places which are not so closely ingrained in this sort of you know Western sort of IP protection regime. And then on the flip side of that, all of these sort of emerging places of entrepreneur entrepreneurial buzz, well, there's a big issue with that being basically places where we already know a lot of stuff is happening because they're either capital cities and they thus draw quite a lot of people and investment, or they are you know big industrial hubs that you know have already been there for quite a while. So how do we actually find out predictions about emergent places um, that, that actually aren't on these maps, right? And, and actually critical um, realization or critical point that we're trying to make here is that we need a new big data solution. We need a new way to crunch available data in order to distill and, and pin down maybe some more of these uh, places of um, innovation driven entrepreneurship. So here it goes. So we've been looking across a whole range of options and we've developed a methodology we call an EPI, which is Emerging Places of Innovation Driven Entrepreneurship, and that has kind of you know four steps, right? So identify and map areas of dense concentration of founders, of people who are you know startup leaders, entrepreneurs. Check with publication and patenting data if there's also high-tech expertise present in the same location where the founders are to be found. Um, check with investment databases if there's an investment scene, if there's recorded investments um, in, in those areas. And check if there's innovation support, especially you know, what are they actually focusing on, what's the research base, what are interventions, government interventions, or other sort of interventions in the ecosystem to support the development of an entrepreneurial culture? So basically, what we are saying is that we would like to combine the kind of the traditional methods of measuring patenting landscape or you know scientific landscape, this sort of you know investment um, high tech drive methodology that you know startup genome and, and others use to try and identify these sort of places of buzz. And then also these new data sources to try and actually map out um, where um, entrepreneurs are to be found specifically. And, and this is precisely, this is really exciting because of course, entrepreneurs are now more increasingly identifiable through professional social networks like LinkedIn. Okay, so this is, this is the thing. So we've, we've looked, okay, so what, what, is, what, is the, what is the available data, right? So of course, there's also the more harder solution, which is we know what we'd like to map. And now we could embark on a 10 year project to try and actually go out there and map everything. But we believe that actually the data is probably already there. It's just not utilized as a way to support this sort of innovation hotspot mapping. Um, and that's what we really went to out to do. So on entrepreneurs and companies, as I already mentioned, LinkedIn, I mean, LinkedIn has a, a really complete data, well, quite complete data set. It's got 200 million profiles in Asia Pacific. So even if we were not you know, talking about individuals, we're talking about trying to map, map patterns. So we're not looking for, oh, there's one person doing something in a particular place. What we're trying to say is that with this many profiles, there's actually a relatively kind of homogeneous distribution of, of sort of clusters um, in, in, the, in, the, in the data set. And, and we've actually went out and sort of proven that. Then papers. Now we've actually shifted a little bit from patents because patents have quite a big coverage variance. And as I said, they're kind of prone to this sort of different regimes in terms of both the local um, IP protection rules, as well as um, how accessible international patent uh, patenting framework is to in different countries. And that's uneven. So rather just for this step, we actually said, well, we're just going to have a look at patent of, of, of paper, scientific publications in the first instance. And Scopus, um, one of the largest citation databases, uh, the one that we've used because it has a very nice sort of uh, geographical breakdown, um, actually has you know nine, almost 19 million scientific publications, right? Um, then investment scene, right? So I mentioned there's this sort of way in which sort of you know uh, startup genome and others are trying to map what where's investment happening. So what we did is we actually looked across a number of investment trackers. These are large data sets that are compiled by companies primarily. Who are basically selling this as investment intelligence, uh, but you can kind of you know, sort of see that they've got a, a relatively decent coverage in bulk, right? So overall, 
um, you know, they're tracking something like, you know, about 100 to 200,000 companies in, in Asia, uh, though um, they are not, you know, again, coverage is, is there's a little bit patchy, so you kind of need to use a mix of them in order to gain some kind of statistic interest. Um, and then, of course, innovation support, that sort of slightly elusive kind of, you know, buzz. And we basically figured out that the only thing we can do is to actually um, once the identification um, down these different databases has been done, we have to actually just go and sense check um, whether these are real clusters or whether there's real kind of support for entrepreneurs and real sort of buzz by, um, you know, effectively manuals, manually searching either digitally or indeed, um, you know, we hope in the next phase to do some, some on field uh, in the ground sort of, um, you know, looking around if you like. So here's a little breakdown of the data. Um, there is quite a, you know, this is uh, for, uh, for all Asian countries uh, or ASEAN countries, um, and is a comparison between like what's the total population, what is the sort of the, the number of profiles in that country on LinkedIn, um, how many people on LinkedIn identify themselves as founders within that data set, and then we've actually looked at Web of Science and Scopus. Um, this is just the results for the Web of Science here um, as to how many. Uh, papers have been published in total, how many papers in the last five years, um, and then the last four are the investment data sets, um, how many investments are being tracked in individual countries. And of course, immediately you see that that doesn't yet quite work for everywhere. Uh, some countries have higher coverage, some countries have much lower have average. Um, in an in that case study, we looked at two countries that have a reasonably good data coverage in the first instance, um, but have a very different kind of cultural uh, dimensions and have a very different um, sort of um, attitudes towards entrepreneurship and, and, and how to do sort of innovation driven um, um, hotspots. And so we try to look at, okay, so how do perhaps those two countries uh, compare to each other? And that's the Philippines and Vietnam. So we got um, this in-depth case study. Um, so piloting uh, this uh, methodology, uh, because of course, you know, to say that on country level, what we described is, you know, that's that's a different level of statistics. But innovation hotspots are clusters; they're specific, you know, cities or city regions, um, and we wanted to really um, map at that level. Um, so the data, I mean, uh, there's the data. Um, we can go, you know, there's just a, a, a reasonable sort of distribution of of, of data in both countries, um, but also relatively crunchable, uh, if if I if I if I use the pun, because um, there is actually um quite a lot of sort of you know still um relatively analytical work that one needs to do when this um is done we hope that maybe one day we can move this to a kind of a platform where this is could potentially co calculated automatically just a quick look through so in the philippines <clears throat> we've broken down um the data again so there's the there's two um more kind of uh, holistic data sets uh in terms of investment than the oh, so sorry three uh, then there is the web of science, and then there is LinkedIn uh, in terms of in terms of um, um, who identify as entrepreneurs within uh, within uh, within those places. And interesting things that we found out, of course, I mean, there's the huge, uh, you know, huge overwhelming number of uh, much of activity in in capital city. Uh, but actually, we have identified some other regional places where there is significant activity. Um, and and that already sort of you know kind of produced some results. So you know emerging places of entrepreneurship in the Philippines, where there is a a reasonable number of investments being tracked, um, where there is a a number of sort of scientific publications being produced by the local research institutions, um, and there's a significant number of um, individuals on LinkedIn identifying themselves as founders and entrepreneurs. Um, so that's you know that's a that's a that's a really kind of an already kind of a, a nice finding. Um, similar thing in Vietnam. So again, you know the the two capital, the two um, large cities, of course, have a a strong a strong sort of dominance uh, there. And you know again, some you know the data is kind of really similar. Um, but we there's another there's a there's a third city, Da Nang, which actually showed up as as again one that has a significant um, number of of both investment uh, being tracked as well as uh, scientific publication. So um, it kind of works, right? So if you do it on a map, this map is courtesy of, of a, a deal room. Um, and, and you can kind of you know, see that um, we've overlaid two maps. We've overlaid the map of uh, deal room tracking investment with a publication data map. 
that was produced by um, in, in another project by colleagues of ours from Paris. Um, and we see that there's some places which are for various reasons actually not um, you know really locales for um, for entrepreneurial um, and scientific activity in the same place, which is this kind of you know two two components, two ingredients. Uh, but we also identified quite a few places which which are, and this is basically us mapping um, the ones that are already shown uh, on on this little on this little map. So to conclude, um, so we have basically developed this approach that we now know can kind of so successfully identify emerging areas of innovation to entrepreneurial activity. Um, the data is not always reliable. I've, I've glossed over some places where I could go into quite a lot of details to actually one investment tracking engine has quite a lot of data on one particular place. None of the other ones are picking up. Is then or should we actually average over all of them or should we just kind of you know combine the two? There's an awful lot of, um, as I say, analytical steps that need to be done in order to actually um, um, you know, understand exactly what's going on. Um, so we need these sort of comparisons across different engines, and we also need further on the ground validation. Um, I've, I talked about LinkedIn profiles. Those are LinkedIn profiles. This is understanding of LinkedIn profiles you can get um, by basically using workarounds that use publicly available uh, data around, around LinkedIn profiling, uh, whereas we don't actually have access to social network data per se. And in order to do more sophisticated analysis, um, we would very much like to work with some of the social uh, network uh, companies in order to actually uh, get access to more granular data. Um, and we are very excited because we know that many of you on this call um, are actually working in the public sector. So we would we are very much looking to also um, making sure that we can complement this with large scale data sets that are available um, in different countries that are kind of publicly held from company registration to occupation registers, et cetera. So, there's hopefully, or we are planning, a next slightly larger scale phase to study. And so if anybody's got either questions about this or would like to be involved, uh, please do let us know. Um, but for now, I think that's uh, that's, that's us. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Uh, that was uh, I mean, very interesting. somehow muted yourself Julia I don't know what happened yeah, indeed uh, I'm, I'm sorry anyway I was just thanking Matt thank you very much for the presentation uh, this is the publication I'm very proud to show you don't see it because of the head background but anyway the policy brief uh, you have uh, you can access it uh, uh, through I think it has been shared to the chat box and as Matt said please please feel free to contact us in case you have ideas because we are already brainstorming uh, uh, for phase two, and we, we really we are very interested to hear from everybody that is participating in uh, in this webinar today, um, because again that was a very scope, promising but also scoping exercise, and therefore uh, uh, any kind of suggestion uh, idea is very very much welcome. Now uh, I would like to continue and uh, uh, to continue our conversation by by, by going straight uh, into our uh, panel discussion. Uh, and let's maybe start with uh, uh, this round of question with Emmanuel San Andres, who's senior analyst at the policy support unit at APEC. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with him because APEC is another organization uh, that uh, is doing quite a lot of work uh, uh, to use alternative data sets and data sources to better understand and uh, to better understand economic dynamics and better inform uh, economic policy making. Uh, Emmanuel, please tell us more about uh, uh, your research uh, uh, through APEC uh, uh, on these issues. Uh, over to you. Yep. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to participate in this discussion. And congratulations on publishing this very interesting policy brief. I learned a lot from the session just before this. Uh, so about our uh, our our study um, in early 2020 during the onset of COVID-19, we found ourselves facing questions from policymakers for which we did not have ready answers. For example, how many people are working in non-standard labor contracts such as the gig economy or sharing economy? How many have shifted to these kinds of employment contracts in response to COVID-19? How many people had full-time work that now have part-time work? doing gig economy, for example. Uh, what, what and where are the skills gap in these, in these sectors? How does the post-COVID future look for women, indigenous people, and others with that potential? Who is hiring, who is not hiring at this point? Um, so these were some questions that we were grappling with 
while we were as well grappled with COVID-19, if you remember that time in early 2020 when a lot of things were, were, were hazy. Um, at the same time, we know that answers to these questions were being generated in real time by the digital economy. We knew that opportunities were being generated in apps like Grab, Uber, and Amazon. We knew that CVs were being updated in LinkedIn and job postings were being posted in job portals like Indeed as well as social media like Twitter and Facebook. We also have, a, so we have here a situation where there's a glaring demand for data and this data is being generated and recorded somewhere, but the supply and demand for this data were not meeting. So this is why we developed our report on big data for the labor market, which we saw as a way to introduce and hopefully get interest in, on using new sources of data to complement traditional labor market information. So in this report, we discuss some of the sources of big data for the labor market. Uh, we are probably more familiar with in, traditional employment indicators such as labor force, employment, underemployment, um, these indicators are generated through regular labor force surveys and cover the entire economy through representative sampling. However, due to high costs, these are often done in fixed intervals, such as monthly or quarterly or annually. And in fact, some APEC economies have yet to do regular uh, labor force surveys. On the other hand, big data are generated as people carry on with regular activities and interactions online. Every click of a button, submission of a form, or payment confirmation is recorded somewhere. And these data, if made available, can provide information on the labor market as well. So in our report, we show some real world experiences of using big data to monitor employment trends. So we showed examples of New Zealand and the United States where they used big data to monitor what was happening in the labor market on the weekly or almost near daily basis. Uh, we also showed how Australia, Indonesia, and Malaysia, for example, were using uh, big data to, to inform their active labor market policies. So this was actually before uh, COVID-19 when they were using, we were using big data to really identify skills and um, um, uh, competencies rather than, rather than job titles and, and degrees and to actually help people who are looking for jobs find those jobs and have good matches good match in their jobs. So we've discussed the pros and cons of traditional and big, big data, but the overarching conclusion for our study is that both are needed to complement each other and in order to have a holistic and real time and timely and accurate view of the labor market. I hope that helps. I'm going to post the, a link to our study in the chat box in a while. So thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Absolutely. I, I really enjoy reading your report, and I'm sure that many of our participants would enjoy it too. So uh, I'm sure that many people would be very curious to get uh, the link to, to, to also the, the APEC report, which again, I mean, shows us that, especially for some countries around the world, uh, we definitely need to uh, go beyond uh, traditional data sources uh, because there's so much more that can be used, there's so much work can, that uh, can really inform uh, policy making, but I mean, everybody that is actually interesting to try to get a little bit, uh, a deeper understanding of certain dynamics. And uh, labor markets are a fantastic example. Again, innovation and entrepreneurship is another one because as showed very well by uh, Matt uh, and also Alessandro, essentially, especially for some countries in the world, just looking at R&D intensity or patents is definitely not enough because there's so much more uh, that is going on and it's, not fully captured by these traditional indicators, those are extremely important. But the point is that we need to go and look for additional sources if we really want to have a, a 360 degree understanding of what's going on. Now, let's continue our conversation. And now maybe with Alessandro um, that uh, uh, is also with us and uh, um, author of the, the study. Alessandro, you, are, you have been working on uh, entrepreneurship and innovation for your entire career, and uh, you're also an entrepreneur. Uh, so given your experience on, the, on, on, the, on this matter, uh, what can you tell us about uh, ways to improve uh, manage, measurement and monitoring of uh, uh, ecosystem development? Uh, what are your observations uh, from your research? Over to you. Please unmute yourself. 
I think we are we are losing. You know, I mean, now that back back to live meetings, and so we are forgetting how to unmute. I thought, I thought it was automatically going to happen. Okay. Um, right. So, um, well, um, in this, I mean, the, the two presentations we've just seen, uh, they sort of explain uh, the reason why it's very important to mix different uh, data sources. And um, because they essentially capture different dimensions of these uh, ecosystems that uh, we are interested in. And uh, as you just said, Julia, uh it it varies uh depending on the kind of ecosystem we are looking at obviously if we are looking at uh, advanced countries uh scientific publications and patents and stuff like that are uh, of the essence uh whereas uh, um in other places uh, we will look for different kinds of data to to really try to map and understand what's going on um in these uh, in these uh, in these uh, in these uh, locations uh it also needs to be said that uh, the, there is uh, a good literature on these um what's lacking really is uh, is more the methodological part um and um and one of the issues that uh, probably we should explore uh, moving forward in the future is not just uh, how to collect and process data that uh, are critical to understand uh, what's going on in specific locations. So different kinds of data for different types of locations, but also understanding the, um, the format and the, of the location. For example, um, how well networked is the location within and also out with, okay? And, uh, and what kind of uh, what we call in the literature and, uh, and uh, what kind of spillover effects you can find in the location. So being located in a specific place, how advantageous it is in terms of what I can learn, how I can collaborate, uh, how quickly I can get access to the assets I need, and so on and so forth. So these are very important things uh, to, to take into account. And, um, and that tells you that basically there are different dimensions that need to be taken into consideration where we try to evaluate this kind of uh, dynamics. Um, so, in a nutshell, I think my experience tells me that uh, depending on, on the need of the client, let's call it, you need slightly different approaches. But uh, what we tried to do in this, pro in this, uh, in this project was, was try to look at uh, across the board throughout uh, the Asian countries, um, where are the most uh, interesting things happening, uh, not using um, necessarily an advanced country kind of methodology but trying to develop one that's more tailored uh, to the needs of uh, of the reality we are trying to analyze and explore and i think uh, uh, there is more work to be done but that's a really good start and uh, and i really hope that uh, we can extend this work into the future uh, because um, as far as i understand um, in asia but like you know, uh, like in, in the West, in, in Europe and the US, ecosystems are now understood to, to be a very important, uh, um, not just conceptual tool, but practical element of, of the policy toolkit that, uh, that the policymakers engaging in uh, um, innovation industrial policy can rely upon uh, for the incremental dynamics uh, kind of processes that uh, we now know for certain uh, or, you know, over 20 and 30 years of studies have demonstrated that they can trigger uh, and, uh, and the impact that they can have on economic growth, but also on, on socio-institutional growth uh, at the local level. Thank you, Lusandro. You mentioned something, I mean, uh, everything you said was very interesting, but I, I completely agree with you. I think now there's, uh, uh, especially in Asia, uh, a lot of emphasis about ecosystem development, what policymakers can do to support the development, not, uh, not of just some actors like the business sector, but all this, you know, glue and web of interaction that defines the ecosystem itself. Um, yes. We were very actually glad to participate in a G20 meetings. Uh, Alessandro is a little bit familiar with it. It's called G20 Digital Innovation Network. It was hosted uh, by Indonesia because Indonesia is the G20 president this year. And the discussion was entirely about, you know, what can we do? I mean, and how the ecosystem is supporting the creation of new startups. So there's a very clear acknowledgement of the fact that uh, we need the ecosystem and we, not, we, we don't need just, you know, some champions or, or some isolated actors. The ecosystem and this web is absolutely essential. 
but we know that we are still lacking a little bit the tools and even the ideas uh, to measure and map and monitor um, trends and evolutions of this ecosystem. And this is why we are here to discuss together. But let's continue our conversation with Matt. Uh, thank you again for the presentation before. And I want to ask you something that is a little bit about, uh, again, how to blend uh, and uh, mix uh, methodologies. Uh, when I introduced you before, uh, we mentioned that Alessandro belongs to uh, the business school and you belong to the School of Engineering of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, my feeling is that uh, to do these kind of analysis of alternative data sets, we increasingly need interdisciplinary skills. Uh, so what can you tell us about that? I mean, uh, you have a background in physics, so you're known in School of Engineering, and you work very much on uh, uh, economics of innovation or also economic uh, development issues. Uh, please tell us more about this. Over to you, Matt. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Julia. And as I, it, you know, it was as much pleasure working with you as it is just to talk to everyone. I mean, it's been, it's been actually, I think, a, a really fantastic um, um, project all around. So yes, interdisciplinarity. You know, I, I should probably expand on that. You mentioned physics engineering. Um, I trained also in between as a social scientist, um, and I currently work very closely with also people in both informatics and in design. And I think um, what we are really seeing is. And a better understanding that um, both our life as well as our sort of economic uh, activity is a, is an integrated system, um, and you need to apply kind of a whole system approach to actually understand what's going on. So data, on one hand, is a critical component. So I think the 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 ability to filter and assess data. I mean, the data is accessible out there. I think the challenge we're having is that perhaps there's almost not too much data, but there's data packaged in such a way that it's not clear what is um, productively useful and what isn't, and how do you actually interpret that data? So on one hand, you have the data analysis. Um, and then on the other hand, I think there's an, another critical dimension here that um, maybe from my sort of physics background as well, but um, definitely uh, comes from this sort of systems approach, which is trying to understand how um, both data sets as well as behaviors and activities are connected. Um, and so I think, you know, as Alessandro said, there's actually a lot of literature that goes and, and, and describes how these ecosystems look like and how they work and all these sort of things. But exactly how they then are reflected in a particular data set is less clear. And you need a little bit of a kind of a um, causal inference to figure that out. Uh, in order to be then able to unlock and interpret what that data set means for mapping the system that you're looking at. So I think that's the critical thing that um, I think interdisciplinary we can do. And then the other issue with interpretation is, okay, so we understand what this means right now, but a lot of people, and, and I guess, you know, why we've done this project is so that this data and this understanding can be used for future policymaking. And there, in the evolution of systems that are so complex and that already sit on so much you know, data understanding, factual information, you need potentially other components, like I say, I mentioned design um, that that enable people to really deal with the complexity and understanding is coming in there. So yeah, the future is interdisciplinary. I think, I hope that the next project will actually already go perhaps even beyond what we've already done in terms of bringing in additional methods, but the critical aspects the understanding of the data and also how it maps onto the real world is 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 just you know it's, it's where is where all of this either stands or falls thank you matt and i think some of some of the things you just said are bringing us uh, to directly into the next round of questions and uh, to emmanuel apec um because you know we know that integrating big data with more traditional data sources is costly and it also requires advanced technical cap capacity. I mean, what just uh, Matt uh, has, uh, has initiated to describe. So how can economies start to implement this transition, especially when we look at uh, developing economies? Emmanuel, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Julia. I mean, um, uh, of course, big data is not easy and it's not cheap. And uh, just to give everyone a context of our membership in APEC, we're 21 member economies in APEC, with, which includes uh, on, on in terms of the income distribution, per capita income distribution, we have the US, China, Singapore, South Korea on one end, but we also have economies like Papua New Guinea, 
Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia, Indonesia on the developing end of the spectrum. So uh, when we were developing this report, we were thinking, how we, what's the practical way that we can actually um, um, introduce this to, to, our, to our membership? And of course, some economies like Singapore are already very much well into using big data in their policy making. But what about the other economies? And uh, I mean, yeah, we know big data is not easy and it's not cheap and a lot of investment was required from various digital platforms to collect and generate big data and continue generating this data. Likewise, significant amounts of skills are needed to collate, deduplicate, structure, parse, clean, and prepare this data for analysis. And then you need another set of skills to analyze this big data into something that could be of practical use to policymakers. So it really is a lot of work, but the good news is governments do not need to go it alone. Um, in this report, the report we discuss some of the opportunities for working with international organizations, the private sector, academia, and other partners to actually um, do get this work started. Uh, so we don't. There's no need to redo to reinvent the wheel. In other words, um, the wheel has been discussed, uh, analyzed, and has been developed elsewhere. We do, we just need to develop these partnerships along with the data sources, including digital platforms, have, make, make sure that those linkages are out there, then we can start thinking about it. Another key step also is to start small. So um, there's, a, I mean, the analogy of chewing to, um, of biting something too large that you cannot chew it. I mean, it's true for big data as well. Uh, first, we need to prove the concept, gain trust, and then scale up. Uh, big data, like any new technology, will need time to be accepted and integrated into legacy systems and processes. So in, in the, it is often best to start small, say one sector or one project. In many economies, in, in what we did, it, in what we've studied, it's active labor market policies because you need a lot of coordination and data to actually make that work. And then show its benefits and demonstrate it and how it can benefit other stakeholders within your governments and within your systems. So in the process, you can find the kinks in your system, find what does not work or work in terms of big data, for your economy, build capacity, and also develop trust in your institution uh, for the users of this, ultimate users of this data. I hope it helps answer your question. Thank you, Emmanuel. It definitely does. Uh, I think those are very relevant points that we should all apply uh, in our work, especially people do, doing our, our work and our having our jobs. Uh, um, because many different actors in so-called innovation ecosystem have been you know, different pieces of the information and definitely this kind of uh, multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-actor approach is very, very much required because skills are a little bit scattered here and there. I mean, uh, so this is actually very, very relevant point. So let's continue our discussion uh, uh, going back to Alessandro. Uh, when I introduced you before, uh, I also mentioned the Innogen Institute. Uh, I would like to hear more about it, also because I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, uh, the issue of uh, measurement, uh, data analytics, uh, will be part of the, uh, will be very much on the agenda of the institution. We would be curious to learn more. Uh, over to you, Alessandro. Thank you, Julia. Julia, I need to correct you there. Um, the new institute I, I work for, um, I've been a member of the Indonesian Institute for many years. They hired me in 2003 uh, to work for them. But um, this year, I've been appointed the uh, Director of Innovation at the new institute that's been set up uh, in Edinburgh. It's called the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Futures Institute, the EFI. And um, this, is a, this is a very exciting uh, thing that it's happening in Edinburgh. It's part uh, of uh, um, an investment that the central government in the UK has made to uh, level up, as they say, the UK economy, which is quite unbalanced uh, towards uh, the city of London in terms of on the southeast of the country. So the government ha had this agenda to level up the economy. And they decided that uh, in Edinburgh, in order to do that, they had to exploit uh, uh, the local uh, capabilities and uh, elements of uh, excellence, which as far as Edinburgh is concerned, we don't really have big companies apart from the bank, the financial sector. Edinburgh used to be the second uh, financial sec uh, city in the UK 
before the financial crisis of many years ago, and the fifth largest in Europe, because we have two of the biggest banks in the world. But a little bit because of the financial crisis and a little bit because they want to diversify the local economic structure, the government decided to invest in the second emerging uh, ecosystem of the city, which is uh, digital tech. So what Edinburgh has developed over the past uh, uh, 15 years is an ecosystem that is based on that sort of technological area of competence, which the university has. Uh, Edinburgh has got the second best uh, um, departments of uh, informatics and uh, AI in the country and in Europe. And around that, a plethora of uh, new startups have started uh, over the past uh, um, 15 years, I would say. Uh, with that, uh, investment has come in, um, more human resources have come in, and the university got organized to exploit that. The University of Edinburgh over the past 10 years has been the best university in terms of starting new companies and patenting new technology in this, in this area. So, um, so the government has made an investment of about, about 150 million pounds over 10 years. And the university is at the epicenter of this uh, process of economic transformation. And that they basically want to reinforce the ecosystem. I saw there was a, a question before from Elton in terms of the uh, sectoral verticals, uh, if they, these are needed or not in terms of the um, evolution of an ecosystem. Well, we do have verticals in Edinburgh in terms of how we want to use uh, digital tech to pervade uh, the, um, the growth and the expansion of sectors of the local economy. And so uh, depending, so six different hubs have been created, which are really interdisciplinary uh, hubs that operate at the interfaces of, uh, of industry and academe in the Edinburgh area. And uh, um, they go from uh, robotics uh, to engineering, uh, space where Matt uh, works, uh, to biology, to agrobiotech. And the one I work for, uh, the Edinburgh Futures Institute, um, is really much linked to the school, to the College of uh, Arts and Social Economic Science of the university, and uh, and um, and the, the remit is uh, is on uh, four specific sectors of the economy that uh, we are trying to develop and pervade using um, using uh, uh, digital tech science and AI, which is uh, fintech. Uh, it's a uh, creative informatics. Uh, where Matt is really active, as uh, we heard earlier. It's, uh, it's uh, in innovation and tech for uh, public services and also for the uh, travel industry that is very, very important element of the local economy in Edinburgh, as you probably know, is, is, uh, is a beautiful city where many tourists come every year. So um, what we're trying to do is trying to create a, um, a transdisciplinary and uh, multi-faced environment uh, that will work a little bit like an innovation lab or a living lab uh, where different uh, constituencies and players will come together, uh, cross fertilize each other. We're going to have events, uh, we're going to have training, we're going to have competitions for startups. Uh, we're going to have, we have a very active venture builder facility. We are developing an incubator. And we are linking all of that uh, uh, with a big investment that the Scottish government is doing. It's called the Tech Scaler uh, to, uh, to grow large companies um, out of this uh, uh, strong entrepreneurial culture that uh, Edinburgh is, is developing. And this, uh, this Tech Scaler uh, will basically be a network uh, for the local companies uh, to go global. Uh, and, and develop the kind of capabilities that you need as, a, as an ecosystem to not, not just develop interesting uh, startups, but also grow them and link them to global networks, uh, to new markets, but also uh, to investors glo you know, globally in Europe, uh, uh, in Asia, and uh, in the US. So we are at the epicenter of this, and this is very important. I was just at the launch of uh, our uh, year incubator and AI incubator um, uh, program. And uh, I was quite surprised by the fact that there were quite a lot of uh, um, entrepreneurs coming to work in Edinburgh from North America, uh, which is supposed to be the place where you would normally go. So I asked them, why, why are you guys here? And the answer that all of them gave me is because of the more compact 
but more resilient and easy to navigate ecosystem that you guys have here. Okay, so it's very easy to talk to the scientists I need to work with. It's very easy to talk to the uh, business angels that are around the city uh, with the financial institutions that are around the city. It's very easy to talk to you, Alessandro, that I know you can help me with the training. We're using the network that the university has and, uh, and uh, the local public resources that are available uh, in the country and so on and so forth. So that tells you a lot uh, about how important this kind of dynamics are and how uh, public resources and the government and the different institutions in one place can work together in a, in a useful and well-coordinated manner in, their, in order to um, not just trigger, but support these processes of ecosystem development. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you for correcting me, first of all, uh, but also for giving us uh, this very practical information uh, I'm very curious. I want to learn more about that uh, um, beyond uh, this discussion online. But also because what you said is, again, I mean, an additional example of how these web of ecosystem relationships are so important and how sometimes we really struggle to even define them and certainly measure them. Again, we are not that yet, uh, that yet, there yet, absolutely. Uh, but this gives us an idea of how important it is to advance research uh, uh, with this uh, specific uh, agenda in mind, because it's something too important to neglect when we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship. But let's now um, conclude um, the panel discussion before going into Q&A uh, with the last question for Matt. Uh, we keep uh, talking about uh, the need of inter interdisciplinarity. We started already discussing about interdisciplinarity with you before. It's something that Alessandro just mentioned uh, uh, lies at the core of uh, this new center just being created and established. And this is also something we need very much for uh, uh, measurement. Um, so what's your take uh, going forward? What should we do? What, what are the barriers? What are the opportunities? Uh, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, that's a very, that, you know, it's a nice question to end the panel with, but it's also an extremely broad question. There's an awful lot to unpack there. So uh, yeah, in terms of, in terms of understanding better the interdisciplinary connections within the entrepreneurial ecosystem, like Alessandro was describing in the case of, um, of case of, of, of our local ecosystem in here in Edinburgh. Um, but also I'd, I'd like to pick up something that sort of Emmanuel, Emmanuel said, right? In terms of the, the future labor market, right? That there's actually quite a lot of um, integration that happens in, in job market between sort of advanced tech skills and then a whole host of sort of specialist skills in healthcare sectors, in in creative that, that Alessandro mentioned, uh, in you know in all these sort of things, and that's that's the real big challenge, right? So understanding that skills landscape is going to be, I think, the thing that's that's critically important moving into the future. And that also brings us to a little bit as to where does our research and the interdisciplinary nature of our research come in, and where you know I mentioned already in the call, uh, already in my presentation. I think the, the critical thing we'd really like to understand, and I think a critical gap in data is better understand entrepreneurs as people. Um, and here actually we have the opportunity, I've mentioned LinkedIn several times, you know, we have the opportunity, there is a lot of data out there, but the tech companies are not always very happy to sort of share that. And of course, there's very good reasons, you know, protecting personal identities, protecting data, personal data. And we definitely, as researchers, uh, want to adopt the highest ethical standards, um, and 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 I would definitely share those concerns. But on the flip side, um, you know, if we are to supercharge this sort of entrepreneurial growth that we all believe is absolutely necessary to ensure both greater economic equality as well as just resilience and prosperity, now that we're emerging from this two years of almost constant disruption, we need to understand, you know, entrepreneurship as collective network of people better and 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 there's there are there are barriers to access that data which uh, unfortunately actually stop us from doing some of the research that we could have done and and provide solid advice to policy makers and to entrepreneurs about what strategies they should deploy in order to get into that interdisciplinary space so there are some barriers for sure uh, but we're hoping that actually working in partnership and i say this was wonderful partnership between um, between um, area and the university but you know, now also maybe with some of the tech companies to make sure that this data is used for, for 
everyone's benefit. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I mean, uh, I will give immediately the floor to TJ for the Q&A, but uh, let me just emphasize a couple of issues you mentioned. One, I mean, uh, the fact that we still need to uh, get a better understanding uh, about, you know, the skills of entrepreneurs. I mean, uh, skills to become an entrepreneur, so, you know, skills related to entrepreneurial mindsets. Uh, and again, I mean, sometimes we struggle to get data to, to really understand that. And another one, uh, it's really the one about uh, global networks of talented people. Uh, the more I read, the more I do research, uh, I really feel that, you know, global flows of talents, uh, this is really what is shaping the emergence of uh, innovation ecosystems around the world. And even when we talk about uh, this global flow of talents, still, you know, sometimes uh, the data could be there, but uh, we don't always access it. Uh, and definitely, I mean, uh, we don't have an harmonized way to uh, analyze the data to get a better understanding. So this is also something that we should maybe uh, put on our to-do list, uh, all of us uh, uh, gathering today to discuss uh, because th there's a lot to do for the future. Okay, uh, I, it's, it's time to me to stop talking and give the floor immediately to TJ. I see some action in uh, the chat box. So over to you, TJ. And thank you once again to all the panelists uh, for the fantastic discussion. Thanks very much, Julia. And thanks very much to all the speakers for sharing. Um, we have a couple of questions. Matt was very active to answer the questions as they were coming, and also it has made my job a little bit easier as well. But uh, maybe let me just continue that part first, because um, Elton then had that follow-up question uh, regarding the direction and the outcome of the large phase research that you are planning to do. Um, so he was wondering whether you could share a little bit more about the phase two plans that you have. Right. So uh, thank you so much, uh, TJ. Of course, thank you, uh, Elton, for, for the questions. I did try and, and answer some on the fly, noting that we probably won't have all that much time for just general Q&A. So um, about the, the phase two, uh, so I mean, there, there's there's several directions um, that are, are, you know, we've already discussed some that are worth pursuing. One, with more granular data, uh, we can understand better the both the sectoral um, as well as uh, the, you know, uh, in other ways, kind of the composition of these innovation hotspots. Um, and especially look as to how to support um, innovation entrepreneurship amongst groups of, of, of people that are usually less represented. And here, you know, we talk about, you know, we talk about gender, we talk about, you know, educational background. We also talk about, um, you know, various sort of kind of cultural reasons why, why, why sometimes, um, you know, entrepreneurship is or isn't seen as a, a pathway, as a career. Um, and so that there's, there's quite a lot of that we could do there. And again, that data would again empower people to both support, um, you know, tailor support for entrepreneurs, um, as well as in broader terms, allow us to identify new avenues and new types of entrepreneurship that are emerging. So that's that's for sure one thing. The other thing that I've also kind of hinted at, and and Julia just sort of brought back in in her last response, is the idea that we still don't have a standardized and kind of a, a any way kind of um, homogenized way to analyze data in this space. Um, and to so advance both the methodology as well as potentially some of the ways in which we process that data because there's still a lot of sort of relatively manual, relatively labor intensive steps. Um, and I mean, well mentioned that as well, like, you know, it, you know, there's quite a lot, there's quite a lot to be done and that actually precludes from some data from being used, even though I completely agree, if, if, if governments or, or en entrepreneurs, you know, are, look, are having issues or are trying to actually do some research, you're not alone. Come to the re come to the universities. We're always happy to collaborate. Come to you know organizations like Area, like APEC. You know there is always a lot of information out there that can be supported with. But you know to develop more this sort of methodological platforms where we can actually both collect as well as crunch this data and make it available. That's that's the other thing that we'd quite like to do as part of this five phase two. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Let me put on my hat as an entrepreneur myself because what you shared was very interesting. Um, from a point where if, if an entrepreneur is wanting to explore a new market, you know, having this type of um, ecosystem mapping um, actually would be very useful because it ties in with what Alessandro alluded to in that, um, you know, if, if the entrepreneur knows that there is a, um, a location, you know, where everything is together, uh, he was saying uh, really about there being a compact, resilient, and easy to navigate ecosystem, I think that would be really useful. 
Um, maybe if I could then throw this next question, um, because I, I noted that the, I think a few, a few of the speakers were talking about um, approaching, you know, who can you approach um, to make this, this next phase more robust? Um, and I think one thing you shared was entrepreneurs themselves, right? Um, LinkedIn is a bit distant, right? Um, so are there, are there any thoughts in terms of maybe engaging business network platforms outside of LinkedIn? Um, or maybe to, to open up a entrepreneurial community, you know, that, that will be interested to collaborate um, because I you mentioned briefly, but maybe just for the sake of the participants, um, is is there is there a I don't know a new LinkedIn platform that you may want to create, you know just just so that the that the entrepreneurs I will volunteer myself. Um, I think Elton already is quite keen to volunteer himself as well. It, would would you be considering something something a bit more tangible, you know, so that entrepreneurs can just say okay, let's just zoom into that, yeah. We would be happy to hear both uh, from Matt and as well as Alessandro. Yeah, no, sure. And, and, and again, thanks for the suggestion. I mean, so on, on one hand, I'd love to say that, yes, let's build another platform, right? But I think we are also living in a time of platform proliferation, right? There's so many platforms out there that people are getting with, you know, That's they have true. so many profiles that are not kept up to date. They have so many profiles, they're not really following any threads anymore, and, and people are just giving up. Um, now, there are definitely ways in which we can map. In fact, in one thing that we were already discussing as part of the sort of thinking about phase two is to look at some of these sort of more data-driven entrepreneurial opportunities and look for places like GitHub forever, code repositories, to try and map out their geographical distribution and see where actually there are people doing particular kinds of codes, right? So, and making particular kinds of software and particular kinds of applications. So there's definitely ways to look for data that's sort of out there, but it's, it doesn't get used or it's a little bit a little bit in, hidden. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily advocate a new platform, but there's definitely platforms out there that we can also tap into. But to go back to the point that actually somebody, I noticed on the chat, somebody's also asked, this is a question for Alessandro's, you know, how can the startup ecosystem in ASIN prepare to adopt for market or corporation with the EU or the UK, right? I think this is the kind of thing, and, 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 and Julia has also touched upon it, right? Globalization, and in particular, how do you actually link these global flows of entrepreneurs so that they're not extractivists, right? We're not just, you know, the US attracts the best people. Now, you know, we mentioned Edinburgh, we'd like to become the data capital of Europe. That doesn't actually mean that we would like to take all the best and brightest from everywhere in the world and just plug them in Edinburgh. On one hand, that is what has historically happened. But that has actually left some countries, you know, benefiting from an awful lot of talent and, and concentration and others, not so much. So what I think is the magical thing that we are also thinking about, okay, so how do you do that, is to develop ways in which this sort of entrepreneurial clustering can indeed happen over distance. And this is where this sort of platform, the kind of community might come in handy. But, you know, if we were to, if we crack this out already, we would have been very rich. We would still might have been on this webinar, but we've been very, very rich okay. um, because you know that's the that's the that's the that's the critical thing. I mean, we've realized through COVID, you can work long distance, you can work remotely, right? But it's there's still some aspects of that that doesn't quite match to the local buzz and that sort of local geographical okay. concentration and that navigability. So how do you replicate that local navigability of clusters that Alessandro highlighted as one of the key points for people being attracted to Edinburgh in a global context, right? That's the holy grail. Um, I don't have an answer. If I did, as I say, we've all been very rich, but you know, I think that's, the, that's where we need to, that's what we need to think about. Um, and I don't know, maybe someone else in the panel has, has thought of a solution and is in the process of getting very rich. I don't know, maybe we'll throw this one open. Um, but let me let me jump in into this. Um, so, some, something you see both uh, now increasingly in the literature, but also uh, I can speak of my own experience as an entrepreneur, and also I've been worked with um, as a I've been counseling, been counseling a, a number of uh, innovation agencies around the world. Is that um, um, yes, the, the local buzz that Mark was referring to is extremely important. But something also that is very important, and this is part of the answer I was giving online to the 
person who asked the question is that um, so what, what's what's critical to the companies that are part of an ecosystem is also the ability of the ecosystem to link them to other ecosystems around the world. This is very important. Um, increasingly, especially with tech businesses, but not just with tech businesses, what you see is that uh, their own ecosystem. So if you just look at the business itself and the kind of relationship and networks they use are not all necessarily local. In fact, scaling up means being able to expand that. And, and so, so one thing that the ecosystem needs to have are global connections. And these are part of the strategic development, not just of the companies within the ecosystem, but of the ecosystem itself. And this is you know, uh, a big part of the agenda that we are trying to develop. Um, you know, becoming networked in this global network of relationships that are absolutely crucial uh, and, and the universities and other local institutions, institutions can be very important in, uh, in, that, uh, in that respect. And something else that is important for emerging countries is the networks that uh, returnees have. So some of you know, the people that have studied abroad, worked abroad, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is, so when they come back, they bring their network. And if uh, uh, there is a strategic uh, capabilities of using these networks to advance, uh, you know, to advance the development of the local networks, but also the local strategy, uh, to exploit the capabilities and uh, and the resources and the assets you can get access to through these networks, then this is extremely important. I promise this wasn't deliberate, but we come to the point of innovation intermediaries, right? Which as it so happened, I've written a book about. So. That's the, you know, so the, the, the critical, the facilitation of these networks, particularly when they are emergent, as Alessandro just said, is absolutely vital, right? Um, and it can be sometimes done by private organization or lead companies, even sometimes, you know, high net worth, well networked individuals who might have actually had these external networks abroad, return, returnees, as Alessandro said, and, and then they set some kind of connection up. Or in absence of that, a, 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 a public policy intervention in supporting this sort of you know, global networking. Well, first cluster integration, as well as then creating this network of networks. And, and you know, if, if that's a, you know, having more data basically just helps you bet, make better strategies in this direction. But when we come to policy, you know, what Alessandro just said is absolutely critical. That's probably at the moment what we would say is, is the best way to grow. Thanks, gentlemen. Emmanuel, would you have anything that you would like to add to this particular conversation, maybe from the APEC perspective? Um, no, I'm finding this conversation very interesting. Actually, I mean, if I may, I have a question for the authors of the policy brief. So, I mean, you did the analysis for the Philippines and Vietnam. And um, I mean, you might have mentioned it in the paper, but. Um, what are some of the policy recommendations? Let's say I am Cebu or I'm Danang, and I want to develop this um, this network. What are some policy recommendations you would give a mayor or a governor or even a, a leader of that economy? And like, do I focus on um, on attracting people like um, Sergey Brin or Bill Gates to come over here and bring your whole network of smart programmers and incentivize them? Do I spend more on um, developing my tertiary education system and having more researchers come here? Do I try to attract foreign or international talent or do I do it from the ground up? Um, if I have, like, like, what's the, what, like, how do we use this analysis in order to say prioritize or have a set of policies that I can use, practically speaking, from from a policymaker's point of view, do one, two, three first before doing five, six, seven, for example. So, yeah, that's what I, I think. If you don't mind, Matt, I'll take this question. Um, so, thank you, Emmanuel. This is a very good question. Um, this is how I met Julia a few years ago. We, we were working on projects of the OECD and the European Union. It, it's you know, exactly on this question. And, uh, and the problem for Europe back then is that uh, they wanted a lot of places uh, in Europe to look like uh, Silicon Valley. 
okay? But there is just one Silicon Valley and a lot of this, of what Europe did, uh, let's say in the first decade of the century kind of failed for two reasons. A, there is just one Silicon Valley or just one, uh, bi you know, just a few biotech clusters that can be successful. But B, the question is, do you have at this specific point in time the capabilities of becoming that? So just throwing some money at uh, uh, potential entrepreneurs, uh, you know, doesn't mean that you're going to be successful. Or thinking that you got the same science or entrepreneurial capacity of those places, and therefore what's needed, it's covering what used to be called the financial gap. Um, it's not going to work. So what uh, what I what we did in the past uh, was to develop this. Um, sort of evolutionary framework that basically says start from the beginning you need to build your own capabilities first and you need to have a strategic agenda to do that okay uh, and in the meanwhile it's very important as i said earlier that you are able to develop uh, uh, your internal institutional social institutional infrastructure um, in terms of the networks that Matt was referring to and so on and so forth, but also uh, start to build the global connections that you're going to need. There is a lot of evidence that the most successful places in Asia that have been able to bridge the gap with advanced countries in the West, that's the way they did it. You build your own capabilities. In the meanwhile, you exploit the networks that you can develop uh, using your returnees, um, developing, uh, you know, scientific capability at universities means that you're going to collaborate with other centers of excellence worldwide. So you're beginning to build networks, and then success breeds success. And so, the more success you have, the more success you want to retain. The more success will attract in terms of new entrepreneurs and successful people that will want to work in your location and so on and so forth. But you got to start from the beginning to build your own capabilities, and you have to do it strategically having an agenda or where you want to go. Obviously, this agenda needs to be adapted. Uh, Matt before was talking about resilience. Uh, I would say in periods of crisis, like the one we are just coming out of, give you an opportunity not just to be resilient, but to do better than what you did before. And in fact, that's what we're trying to do uh, in Edinburgh and other places, You know, to build new companies, new capabilities, new networks that are better than the one we had before. And, uh, and that's a, that needs foresight and strategic thinking, which need to be adaptable to the new conditions that uh, are emerging. And the entrepreneurs will do that, but the entrepreneurs will be part of this ecosystem. So you need a strategic steer uh, at, at this ecosystem level, which is critical. And, and that's why we are trying to develop this infrastructure in Edinburgh. Thanks, Alessandro. Um, thank you. To all the speakers for really, you know, the exciting and robust discussions. Um, I think like Matt alluded to earlier, you know, this topic can go on for a few more hours, uh, but in the interest of time, you know, I just want to thank the speakers. I'll just hand the floor back to Julia uh, for some closing remarks. I don't have much to add. I think we are running out of time, but I would like to thank everybody. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. As she said, we could uh, go on uh, for hours. Thanks to all participants to stay with us until the very end. And of course, uh, many thanks to uh, Matt, uh, Alessandro, and also very much Emmanuel for sharing the APEC perspective. Uh, please stay in touch with us. If you want to learn more about this kind of dialogues, uh, the activities we are doing, our reports, you can connect with us through LinkedIn or our website. Feel free to have a look at it. Uh, and please uh, stay tuned for um, the follow-ups uh, of these studies and anything else we are preparing for you and the broader Asian innovation community. Thank you very much. Have a nice end of the day. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Julia.